Hey everyone, welcome to episode three of Truck Safe Live, the show where we and our guests tackle the hot button issues impacting highway transportation. I'm Brandon, this is Jared. We're with Truck Safe Consulting and Childress Law, both of which are dedicated to helping motor carriers develop and maintain cutting edge safety programs. Jared, we've got another great show planned for today. Yeah, I'm excited. We've got two great guests. I'm going to get some good questions, hopefully. Um, thanks for everyone for uh, tuning in on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, wherever you're watching live. Um, if you're listening to this after the fact on Apple, Google, or Spotify podcast, thanks a lot. Be sure to check out the show notes. We'll probably have a link to an article in there or some other information. 
Um, also keep in mind, we've had a couple of other shows already. Um, we had a show on nuclear verdicts. Uh, we had Steve Bryan from Blue Wire. We had John Esparza from the television. And then we had another show on telematics with industry vet Tom Cuthbertson. And then we also had Mike Malacha of TVS Analytics. So um, check out those shows if you haven't already. Um, like I said, we'd like to have participation today. So if you have any questions, feel free to just type those in the comment box and hopefully we'll be able to address those during the show and just pop them up so everyone can yeah. see the questions. Kristen already says, woohoo, let's hear about the war on IC status. <laughs> Brandon, are there any uh, uh, special effects that we should be aware of that you're going to be using during the show? I don't have any special effects for this show, unfortunately. Okay. Just wondering. So it's, it's just us. Surprised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, so today's topic is the war on IC status. Uh, no secret there. Um, obviously, a huge issue in the industry um, going back many years now. Um, you know, one of the first show, as Jared mentioned, we talked about was nuclear verdicts and, and the tremendous exposure that a lot of motor carriers in the country have to those types of nuclear verdicts. But just as uh, as scary as a potential nuclear verdict stemming from a highway accident is a potential reclassification determination for motor carriers that that use owner operators or have owner operator fleets. And we can get into the details with with Wendy and Doug here in a little bit about, you know, what types of of trouble carriers can get themselves into. Um, but uh, this issue of the independent contractor status of, of owner operators, I mean, th the use of independent contractors in this industry just goes back for decades. I think going back to the 30s, we saw the use of independent contractors in, in the industry. And in fact, some of the largest motor carriers that we have operating in the country today started out as a one truck operation, an owner operator. Um, I just pulled right before the show here, pulled some facts from the um, from OIDA, Owner Operator Independent Driver Association. Uh, there are approximately 350 to 400,000 uh, owner operators operating in the country. Uh, according to some studies, this accounts for around 12% of the entire driver population in the U.S. Uh, the median net income of an owner operator is $150,000, which is crazy. 6% uh, of owner operators are women. Typical owner operator has accumulated over 2.9 million miles driving and 34% of owner operators have, have served in, in the military. And so I think Jared and, and be interested to hear your thought, what we've learned over the years talking with owner operators in our own practices and carriers with owner operator fleets is that, you know, it's not always, it, it's rarely a situation where you'll encounter an owner operator who doesn't want to be an owner operator, who didn't voluntarily choose that profession. I mean, I, we've talked with several owner operators who like the, the, entrepreneurial spirit that they that they have and they want to use that to, to grow their business and they find that opportunity in being an owner operator um, their freedom to kind of grow their business from one truck to two trucks to ten trucks all the way up to the the huge fleets that we see today so I think those are those are just some of the benefits and obviously um, you know as I already mentioned we pulled these facts from OIDA that since it's such a huge group of, of drivers we're talking about here they have their own interest groups that that look out for them so it's just a huge population uh, of really great professional drivers out there who most of them in my experience at least uh, want to be uh, want to be owner operators yeah those those statistics are pretty interesting and I think a lot of people even in the transportation industry aren't aware of a lot of those statistics that you just pointed out particularly the median net income being 150,000. I mean, that's that's why independent contractor status is still very popular in the transportation industry, because if you are somewhat business savvy and entrepreneurial, you can really do well for yourself in this IC space. So um, having said that the benefits there that you've stated in your stats, you know, we do have a lot of problems as well. So, you know, in this space, we have some carriers that take advantage of the system in, a, uh, in order to avoid the employment taxes and some of those benefits and some of the owner operators just kind of get taken advantage of. That's not terribly common, but it does occur. And, and this has kind of led to the skepticism of the independent contractor classification issue. And so some states have uh, put in efforts, whether it be legislation or aggressive plaintiff's bars to 
to address independent contractor status and and through legislation or from actual case law adopting um, classification tests um, we've seen a ton of these tests developed such as you know the right to control abc test economic realities test um, irs multi-factor test and and you know part b of that abc test kind of makes the trucking industry uh very uncomfortable obviously because part b of that test requires that the worker uh, perform work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business i mean how do you even get around that in the trucking industry yeah. um i'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about that today but i mean that's a huge question that i have i mean what how do you do that how do you even get around that i mean there's been this gray area um in the independent contractor space for a long time that it's just kind of this cat and mouse game that goes back and forth you know uh, a law gets put in place or a bad case gets put in place and then the model changes to address the gray area that's created but this this part b i mean that's just insane to me how how the trucking entities could survive in the space by using independent contractors yeah and i just put up on the screen here jared uh, we'll talk about assembly bill five here in a minute california's uh recent legislation but it adopts a version of the abc test here just so we can see what you're talking about here the b prong uh is listed right up here on the screen so i you know i think that's exactly right i mean we've got all of these various um kind of issues that can be caused by reclassification of drivers, just some examples from our own experience. Um, in a prior life, I was I was involved in a lot of um, uh, administrative cases involving independent contractor classification for carriers that would get caught up with unemployment uh, tax assessments or workers' compensation reclassification decisions. And so, um, you know, just thinking back, one of the um, more significant unemployment cases I had <clears throat> was was a California case. It was a large motor carrier that had a, a huge owner operator operation in um, in California. And the the state of California came in, did an unemployment tax audit, looked at all of their their relationship with all of their owner operators and ended up reclassifying all of their owner operators. I think there were over 2000 owner operators reclassified as that carrier's employees. And that resulted in, a, in an assessment of back taxes going back four years of just unemployment taxes of well over two million dollars. So, I mean, that's fairly common thing you see with these types of reclassification decisions, at least at the state level on the administrative side of things. And then of course you've got your other uh, big exposure, which are, which are class action cases where the plaintiff's bar has become pretty savvy to this idea of, of drivers alleging that they are improperly classified as independent contractors. And it's not uncommon there. I just pull up some, some recent cases, headlines from recent cases here where you'll have multi-million dollar settlements in those cases. Um, you know, this new prime case, uh, federal court case, um, I think it was a couple of years ago now, settled for $28 million. It was a reclassification decision. That one went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. It had an issue of arbitration uh, involving owner operators in that case. And then, you know, just another one there as an example, a J.B. Hunt case settled for $6.5 million. So we talk about nuclear verdicts. Again, this is just another area where you could see these these huge verdicts. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and certainly, you know, if you watch our show on nuclear verdicts, I mean, we kind of classify the, the definition definition of a nuclear verdict is commonly held as a verdict that's $10 million or more, right? And obviously with these, you know, nuclear verdicts that are related to highway accidents, we're dealing with serious injuries and losses of life, which is very different than, you know, dollars related to a judgment. So there, there's a big difference there, but a lot of the claims that you'll see in those class actions, FLSA claims, overtime claims, uh, minimum wage claims, unlawful wage deductions. And I certainly don't uh, classify myself as an attorney that has a ton of experience working on these class actions. But, you know, when I first started as an attorney uh, for a transportation firm, I was able to work on some of these class actions for a couple of years supporting these, you know, partner level attorneys that this is what they do is class actions. And I was able to watch them, you know, in their craft. And it's very fascinating. The plaintiff's bar has kind of the same playbook that they use for a lot of these cases. But unfortunately, the defense attorneys don't always have the exact same playbook. They have to get creative in responding to some of these arguments. But, um, 
just like with the nuclear verdict, I mean, if you've if you've been sued in a class action, you've kind of lost already because you're, you're going to have to go through the discovery process, most likely get yourself to, you know, class certification. And, and it's very, very expensive just from a legal fee standpoint, let alone a judgment standpoint. Yeah. So, I mean, things seem grim. And so that's why we uh, wanted to do this show and, and see if we can uh, talk with with experts on this issue and figure out are there are there steps that carriers can take to protect themselves against these uh, these types of cases and these types of uh, administrative reviews and so um, we're, we're super excited to have a, a couple of, of um, great guests on today who who are very knowledgeable about this subject probably some of the most knowledgeable individuals on this subject in the country and so we want to first welcome on wendy greenland she's the ceo of open force um, you can check out her full bio over at our website at trucksafelive.com but wendy has more than 25 years of experience developing and delivering technology driven business services and solutions through Open Force, Wendy and her team provide industry-leading services to independent contractors and motor carriers, including driver onboarding, um, settlement processing, and many other solutions. So welcome to the show, Wendy. Thank you. Nice to be on the show. Yeah, so give us a, a little bit of background about yourself and how you got involved in the transportation industry. Well, as you mentioned, I, I spent most of my career in technology. So I, I started my career in telecommunications, moved over to software. Most recently, I was in the HRIS and payroll side of the W-2 side um, in, in the software industry with working with employees and their benefit needs and, and all of the requirements to get them onboarded and, and compliant. But um, in, in looking at my career and where I was heading, I, I was ready for a change and, and I wanted a change. I love solving problems with technology. And when Open Force reached out to me and I started to look at what the problems they were solving with the 1099 model in the space, I could see on the W2 side of the house when we were working with the software and payroll companies there, some of the issues that people were running into and the things that they were doing that were causing so much risk when it came to the 1099 model. And so be, being able to have an impact on that through Open Force and the technology that Open Force provides was a real exciting opportunity for me. So Open Force, of course, is my introduction into transportation. Prior to that, it was all software and, and employee side working with employers. So at Open Force, we're 90% transportation, 90% working with drivers every day. And so I had to learn the transportation industry and how um, technology can solve the problems with regards to the 1099 classification issue, the, the 1099 model. And um, I, I did that back in January, February of 2019 was when I began that journey. And I loved it, loved every minute of it. So is it deliberate that you all think you have 90% of, of the trucking industry as your clients? Is that something you focus on or is it just uh, 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 saying something about the industry that it's so prevalent in this industry? You know, we grew up in the courier and last mile space. We, that's where we began to um, do our business as open force. We've been in business for 20 years and, and it does say something I think about, um, some of the the early business practices and courier that we needed to really look at misclassification and the classification issues early on in the courier side what we're seeing is more and more misclassification activity going on in multiple industries not just transportation we're seeing activity in home health in construction referees just popped up and i mean all anybody who's working with an independent contractor workforce now is is starting to run into classification issues so we're seeing it all over especially in gig we're really growing in gig but we absolutely started in courier and last mile grew into trucking and um so transportation has been our our um bread and butter for for a number of years because i believe that that's really where um, a lot of the misclassification activity began and 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 grew out of so we've we've become dominant we are primarily trying to solve the model issues we're a 1099 model uh, solutions company and we use technology to do that and so transportation really has been um, our, our focus for that reason yeah so tell us about that what what exactly does open force do and what services does it provide and how are you working to to solve that problem for carriers so 
what I love about the space, what I love about transportation and what we do in transportation in particular is that that the 1099 model in transportation to me is, as you mentioned earlier, it's the true entrepreneurial spirit of, of America, right? You've got people who want to have the flexibility, they want to own their own business, and they want to have higher earning potential. You just mentioned the OIDA numbers regarding the earnings potential. We see that every day, especially once you get into the last mile and trucking side of, of our population, the earning potential is well over 100,000 in the drivers that we work with. So there's a lot of potential for, for multiple income streams, for higher earnings potential. And um, what we do is we provide a streamlined process for onboarding compliance, insurance, and settlement for any independent contractor. And primarily we do that for drivers every day. Great. You mentioned the earning uh, potential for for drivers, and I think that's just so interesting. Do you have any examples of of uh, contractors that you work with that you've heard some crazy stories with how you know how they've grown their businesses or anything like that? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, we just um, we're going to be featuring a a woman truck driver who started uh, with a uh, just a courier last mile one one sprinter van, and now she's grown into a fleet of. Um, small truck. She's got a, a small business. So now you have a woman business owner who started just as a, a last mile driver. And, and we see that all the time. We have um, many of our independent contractors were originally just a truck and a dream or a, or a car transporting courier or labs, um, you know, whatever they were transporting. And now they have a fleet of vehicles working and subcontractors working for them. And, and we see that all the time in, in our business. And we try, we're trying to feature those. We just did a podcast with one of those uh, owner operators that is now, uh, you know, a carrier in his own right has a, a number of trucks that that are on his fleet and just really exciting to see them grow and and become small business owners and and we play a part in that and and that's what i love about what we do every day yeah i think you know at least in my experience and and i've had the pleasure of um you know interviewing a lot of owner operators over the years and the work that i did for carriers and i think that's the part that that so many, you know, whether it's the plaintiff's bar or the state agencies either miss or they ignore, you know, deliberately ignore is this idea that a lot of these owner operators feel like they have the independence to grow their businesses. I mean, I, I would, uh, you know, I had to depose a number of, of owner operators who were just that they, they had the same story. They started out as one truck realized that, Hey, I can, I can really increase my revenue by, by building up to more trucks. I can hire my own drivers. So they do that. And it's, it's just something you don't hear. I think in a lot of the, in a lot of the litigation, a lot of the state cases that, that involve this issue absolutely we have so many that are that are out there doing that and you know what they need really is someone just to kind of help them and that's what open force does we kind of help them with here are the tools that you need in order to do this successfully one of the key issues that we run into oftentimes you were talking about nuclear verdicts is the insurance uh, you know they want to get into this business they need to own their own compliance they need to understand what they have to have in terms of a background check and a drug screen and an mbr but they don't understand the insurance requirements and that's really i think where open force is at our best because we walk them through all of those pieces and then we make sure that we're offering and we're facilitating insurances in the market through the broker and partnerships that we have to try and give them as many options as they can have to meet the cargo or GL or, or occupational accident requirements they have for insurance. And, and those insurances are really what begin to step in and prevent those nuclear verdicts. If they know what they need to have and they have the proper coverages, and, and even more so if they start to bring on subcontractors, what does that mean from a contractual and insurance standpoint? How do they how do they prevent you know, a nuclear verdict from a subcontractor that maybe they said, hey, can you help me out today? And they don't have the compliance items and insurance items they need. And yeah. those are the things that I believe really technology can help to solve for. So the insurances we offer tend to be more percentage based when you're on dispatch but they but they are beginning to now understand the insurance companies that they have to cover the subcontractors and so those percentage based options really cover from the the owner operator down through the subcontractor level and and that's an exciting part i think about where we're going and the problems that we're solving through our technology 
Yeah. And I think the other important part of that, at least in my experience is, is you talked about giving them options, multiple options to, to go different ways, source different, uh, different options that work for their businesses. And at least what I've seen in cases is, is the story that's told is that, that these owner operators are beholden to the motor carrier for, for whom they work and they don't have any options except to do what the motor carrier is telling them to do to enroll in the programs that they're told to enroll in. So here it sounds like, you know, they have multiple, uh, options available to them to, to pick what works best for their business. Yeah. So, you know, this is where I think technology is really important in solving this problem, because if you have a technology that can provide them numerous options, can track that they're selecting options and can provide them multiple revenue streams, multiple contracting companies for them to work for. Now you're you're beginning to see how the multi-factor test, whether it's Borello, whether it's the economic realities, whether it's the ABC test, that they're mark, they're able to market their business through like our IC recruit program. They can then go out and market and say, hey, I'm available for work. Once they begin to do that and you can track that through the technology, then all of those logs that you create in the technology can be used in, in, you know, a deposition, for example, you can hand that over to a deposition attorney and they have everything they need to say, yes, this relationship was built properly. They knew what they were doing. They were able to market their business. The contracting company has visibility, but they're hands off. There's no direction and control here. And so you have the technology then begins to support the relationship in a much different way than it has in years past. So where we're going, you know, with open force in the portability plan that we're creating now through through where we're going with a, an eventual marketplace. We've begun that through our IC recruit portal. That technology is now being built so that they can then show that, that they are they are a business with their own right, marketing their business, multiple revenue streams. Let the technology work for you. Technology used to be a nice to have. Now it's it's a must have in, in the legislative landscape we have today. Wendy, so when the- can I, I was going to ask you real quick. So you probably see some fluctuation in um, activity related to independent contractors onboarding. So we talked about how it, there's kind of the sense of doom and gloom with, you know, the Californication of IC status that's going on. And, you know, have you seen fluctuations in drivers being onboarded as independent contractors? I mean, you're probably involved with, you could be onboarding the same driver multiple times in one year based on the turnover, but have you seen a rise in independent contractor drivers? Have you seen it stay the same or go down? What are you seeing? So we're seeing growth in the independent contractors within our platform. Now, what I believe is going on is that we're now facilitating portability, which means that once they log in and, and contract with any one of our companies in the ecosystem, then that information now lives with them and they can now own that insurance and own that compliance and begin to work with multiple with multiple companies. We also do more than just transportation. So there's gig and, and other work available, but but by them having the ability to now be portable, it's much easier for them. Years ago, it was just one contract and, and they would go through that contract. And if they wanted to work for someone else, they'd have to start all over. We wanted to eliminate that and make it very easy for them to be portable within the ecosystem. So we are seeing that more and more that they're starting to do that. And, and that's, in my opinion, that supports the model. So we need insurances that reflect that. We need them to be able to, to take those insurances and work for any company and, and, and do the business as a true vendor in the way that they see fit. And that really is what the model should be about. And that promotes, I think, the, um, the entrepreneurial spirit. This is my business, my way. And, and now, you know, you, you, you're looking at this classification status. It's very hard to disprove when, when all of those pieces are in place and you can prove it technically. So, Wendy, what would you say are the biggest benefits to, uh, we'll stick with the transportation industry, to motor carriers that, that source their independent contractors from a third party like Open Force over sourcing them directly? Well, it, it, if we are monitoring the compliance and you tell us what the contract requirements are for insurance, for safety training for all of those elements, then we can then take that from there and then walk the independent contractor through that. 
we're, we're looking at the model as a whole and we're making sure that all of the elements from compliance to insurance, recruiting, all the way through the payments that they get every week are independent. So the way we've built our platform is that each and every step along the way is a step that mitigates risk. So in our IC recruit, we're doing it in a way that mitigates risk. We're not just recruiting drivers, we're recruiting them into a portal where they can then market them to multiple companies. Now that's proving out the model, right? They're marketing. So every step in our process, when as they go through the compliance items, as they pull in insurance, the insurance allow for subcontractors and allow for portability and allow for choices. Every step that we're taking, which is different from most other companies out there, is mitigating the risk and proving out the model as opposed to just going with any company out there that can do, anybody can do, guys, anybody can do onboarding and compliance and, and pay, pay people. There's, there's hundreds of companies out there that do that, but very few understand the model and are out there looking at the legislation every day and trying to drive the technology to support the model and make sure there's a separation um, of direction and control. And that's, I think, what we offer as a technology every, every day to our drivers and our contracting companies that work with them. And you talked about training um, as one part of the services that you offer. And that's one of the things that's already, always really gotten under my skin. It's that this constant pitting of independent contractor status uh, uh, against um, a carrier's effort to comply with the safety regulations. So obviously uh, dealing with safety regulations is something that Jared and I are constantly doing. We're constantly counseling motor carriers on how best to um, build up their safety programs and, and make sure they're meeting industry standards. And, and we're always, it seems like when we're working with owner operator fleets, we're always having to walk, tiptoe that line of that, hey, that's too much control you're imposing by taking this next step of training your drivers on uh, giving them additional training on hours of service. And it always just seems wrong to me that a motor carrier's efforts to, uh, to train their drivers how to properly log their time and avoid fatigue driving is going to be used against them in court or, or in state cases cases uh, to, to show that they're controlling these drivers and and that the drivers are there for their employees. So I'm curious how Open Force is addressing that from the training side of things. Yeah, you know, it's it's a slippery slope, right? It, it becomes almost a catch-22. They have to be trained, but you can't do it. So who's going to do it? And, and how are they going to get the training that they need? Um, you know, in my opinion, the only way to do that is to leverage a third party to help make sure that they get the, you, you let us know, for example, as, as open force or whoever your third party is, you let them know. And you say, these are the requirements and, and we need to be able to prove that that's been done and they are certified in these areas. And then that's it. It's a requirement of the contract, right? I'm not telling you, you have to, I'm saying, if you want to maintain this contract, you have to meet these requirements. You go do that. But here's some options of who can do that with you. And we know are really good at getting it done and, and doing it effectively. And so I think that becomes the, the only way to really kind of balance between that and, and, and get the training safety training without, without control over how they go about doing that. So with Open Force, we've been partnering. I know we've talked with you guys about adding um, some of the training that you're doing, the deep dives that we need, I think, for the owner operators. Um, but the safety training, there's a lot of um, good training uh, LMS platforms out there that can do this. We've now partnered with Samba Safety with Quarter University for our new IC university that, that can be leveraged through the platform. The best thing you can do is have it available to them as they're onboarding so that they're getting these things, but it's not something you're you're controlling. It's something that that open force or whoever you're working with is is leveraging on your behalf to meet the, the terms of the contract. Yeah, Dylan was asking a question along those lines. He says, how can carriers protect their safety ratings if owner operators safety and compliance practices do not match theirs? I've seen many smaller carriers bullied by individuals who own the truck, but are operating under the carrier's authority. And and I, I think that's exactly right, Wendy. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, things are the way that they are at the moment where any effort on the motor carrier's part to, to push out things that aren't 
obviously mandated by the regulation. So obviously there's a ton of stuff that's mandated by the regulation. So the regulations say carriers have to have a drug and alcohol testing program if they have CDL drivers. And so, you know, you'll find plenty of cases out there that will say, okay, when it's the government telling you, you got to do something, we're not going to consider that evidence of your employer type control over the driver. But if you do anything that steps above those regulations, that's going to be you controlling the the driver in a in a in an employer way and and that's going to count against you in those employment classifications. So I think the only way unfortunately the, to deal with it now is to separate the two. Is to anything that goes above and beyond the regulations, you got to have you got to you got to talk about it in terms of it being a contractual obligation with the owner operator. They have an obligation to operate safely. Uh, they have an ob obligation to follow the regulations. And if they don't do it, then, you know, that's a potential breach of their contract. Uh, and then you talk about it in those terms rather than in kind of the traditional employee terms of, okay, now we're going to discipline you for, uh, for not doing these things. Right. But if, if we step in and tell the owner operator, OK, so in order to maintain this contract, you have to have these safety regulations. But by the way, now that lives with your ICID in the system and you can use that and say, hey, I have this certification. Now I'm able to, to leverage that for other income streams. I have the flexibility. I'm owning my own compliance and certifications. Now it's it's a true vendor relationship that that in, that owner operator really becomes an owner of their own credentials, their own insurance, and their own certifications, and that supports the model. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Wendy, I know that went quick, and uh, we're running out of time here. We're gonna. Um, talk with Doug Graw here in a second. So I just want to thank you for, for being on and we'll get you back on here in a second with Doug. So thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. So the next guest that we have, we're happy to have attorney Doug Graw on the show today. Doug brings an interesting perspective to the IC conversation. He was previously the general counsel for a large IC model motor carrier for almost 15 years. And he's also been in private practice where he's addressed these IC issues directly on a regular basis. Um, Doug is currently the CEO of the Graw Group, where he focuses on helping the transportation industry with IC programs, risk management programs, and business planning and performance rebounding. Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks guys, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for being here today. Um, so you've been in the trenches on these IC issues for years and years as an advocate for carriers and owner operators. So what pulled you into this area? Because you've been here for years and years, right? Yeah, and I have to thank uh, one of my first uh, professional mentors. There's a guy by the name of Jim Hardman. Uh, Jim Hardman is a pillar, uh, was a, a pillar, unfortunately, he has passed. Uh, he was uh, my previous employer's longtime general counsel for uh, literally 50 years and um, getting a chance to learn underneath him. And, and he was very passionate about the independent contractor issue. And what he believed in was the, the, the importance of speaking up on the issue. So he got me engaged early on on what's going on politically, what's going on uh, at the agency level and just truly understanding the business model and its importance to both the contractors as well as to the carriers. Excellent. Um, so based on discussions with you and kind of seeing your work cited in cases and articles over the years, you're sort of an independent contractor historian of sorts. Does it make you uncomfortable to be called that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I, I truly, they, they, uh, I do know a lot about it. I'm not going to lie about that. But but uh, yeah, there are plenty of others in the industry that know just as much or, or more than I do as well. Um, and, and I know we can think of a, a handful of you, who those are, but uh, uh, it's, it's an issue I care about. Uh, and more than anything, I care about it because there are so many myths out there about it. Um, if, if we're going to lose on independent contractor status, I don't want to lose on myths. I don't want to lose on myths like uh, we use independent contractors to cheat taxes. That's not why carriers use independent contractors. Uh, that kind of stuff gets me fired up and, and, and I have no problems arguing with people about when we get into that kind of stuff. So on the, on this article, so let's just talk about the article. You wrote it back in 2008. Um, it's in the Transportation Law Journal. I'm going to post a link in the comments here with the, a link to the article. But 
The article's titled um, Have Truck Will Drive the Trucking Industry and the Use of Independent Owner Operators Over Time. And so it looks at kind of the history of owner operators that dates back to the 30s, like Brandon said, um, and their importance to the industry. I mean, they were critical to the industry becoming what it is today. Um, what made you write this article? Because, I mean, it's it's a huge, like I said, it's in a law journal. It's 23 pages long. It's fantastic, but it's a huge project. What made you do that? Jim. Uh, <laughs> Jim, <laughs> Jim was adamant about doing it. He said, you, you need to do this. It's a great, and, and he was right. It was, a, it was a fantastic way to learn the issue and to learn the industry and, and so on. So he he's the one that encouraged me to do it. Uh, and, uh, and I said, I idolized the man. So I, I was, I was happy to take it on. It was a lot, uh, but, but I, I really did enjoy writing it and getting to know the issue that way. And it's, it's led to, you know, getting to write on, on the Supreme court case that's going on today. So uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity. Yeah, it's funny, Doug. I, I told you this story, but it, we got you on the show. We got you booked for the show because we'd seen some of your other interviews. And in preparing for the show, I was like, I remember this article I used to cite all the time in uh, in cases that I was briefing for for various courts. I was like, I'm going to pull that out and just take a read through it. And then I look at, a, look at it and the author is Doug Graw. I was like, wow. So he is the historian on this topic. <laughs> So what's well, it like? So, what's it like seeing your 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 work get cited by judges and and attorneys? It 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 is it's neat. It's a little bit of a feather in the cap. I'm I'm not gonna lie. Uh, that that that's cool. Um, because I wouldn't say that if you talk to my law school friends, they would probably not have picked me as the first person from our class, uh, to be cited uh, with, with that kind of regularity. But uh, but no, it it it's neat and um. I, I promise I'm not drawn on too much about Jim, but when when I first met him, he he sent me a handful of his articles, and and we know this as as lawyers that judges never care what you think; they care about what other people think. So it's always always about citing other people. Jim was able by the by the tail end of his career to write articles and only cite himself. <laughs> Everything was his case or his article or whatever. Uh, and you, I just knew I was getting to learn from, from somebody that was, was pretty fantastic. And, um, he, he, it was a great way for me to learn the industry. Oh, yeah. I was getting ready to ask, have you become comfortable with the fact yet of citing yourself? Have you gotten to that place? <laughs> <laughs> I am not on his par by, by any stretch of the imagination, but, uh, it, it's, it's neat. Yeah. On, on a little bit further on the article. So one of the sections in your article is titled, the future of independent owner operator, a business model facing challenges. Um, so at this point, should we be replacing the word challenges with existential crisis? Are we at that point? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I do think we are at one of the, the, the biggest uh, inflection points uh, in the model's history. That being said, if you do research the history, there are battles you can find, I could pull out quotes from Congress in 1936, that if I didn't tell you they're from 1936, you would think they're from a hearing two weeks ago. You can pull that out in the 40s. You can put the, in the 1930s uh, is when we start getting into the ICC and regulated era and all, all that kind of stuff. The 1940s, truth and leasing regulations come around because of arguments about independent contractor status. Uh, the 19, uh, excuse me, the, the, the truth and leasing were a little bit later than that, but uh, 1970s, uh, you, you get uh, a lot of clamoring about independent contractor status because of fuel issues. Uh, this issue has never really gone away. Um, but yes, AB5 is in, in what's going on in California. And while I don't really think anything's going to happen with the PRO Act, but to the extent something could happen with the PRO Act, that is as serious a challenge as uh, the independent contractor model has ever faced. But I also think it's not just necessarily so much a, the challenges that are happening legally. Think about what's happening in the marketplace. There's ne there hasn't been demand like this for capacity. And uh, you know, every day you open up any of the, 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 the publications, Freightways, Transport Topics, CCJ, whatever it is, and there's some new app coming out from some logistics company, uh, some carrier with them, some new model. There are uh, fantastic opportunities for small capacity providers and what that's, how the independent contractor model is going to evolve because of that 
And, and I'll say kind of last is the cost of equipment. It is so expensive to get into a good truck these days. What impact is that going to have on the future of the independent contractor model? And this, especially as we have more and more environmental regulations coming along, what's going to coming along, what's going to happen with electric vehicles and all that kind of stuff, uh, getting that capacity uh, how does that impact the ability for one person to go get a truck? And I don't pretend to have the answer to that question, but I think all of those things together is what makes this uh, the most influential or the most impactful or most important time in the history of the independent contractor model, not just what's happening legally. Yeah, and you mentioned AB5, Doug, can you give us, because uh, obviously that's the big news lately, can you give us a, a, just a brief recap of what that is and why it's so important? Yeah, AB5 is California's version of the ABC test. You covered it well uh, earlier on, Brandon. Uh, so the ABC test is one of the definitions uh, that are used by various states and agencies around the country to define whether or not someone is an employee or an independent contractor. The problem with the ABC test in California is California's version is much more strict than everyone else's. Uh, Massachusetts had one similar, but Massachusetts was struck down. Uh, the California version says it, the, the most important part is a three-factor test, an A, a B, and a C. The B factor says that the worker cannot do work that is integral to the contracting company. It's pretty tough to argue that a truck driver is not integral to a trucking company. So we have the situation where Massachusetts passes this law and it is struck down. It's struck down because of a federal uh, preemption issue. It's called F quad A. I'm not going to go into the details of that. It's way too wonky. Um, California's version is being challenged, but has not been struck down yet. And uh, thankfully to the good folks at the California Trucking Association, to Cal Cartage, to the American Trucking Association, to Minnesota Trucking Association, to all sorts of, of, of industry advocates, uh, that has been challenged to the U.S. Supreme Court. And fingers crossed, the U.S. Supreme Court will take the case uh, sometime, uh, I guess probably sometime in 2022, uh, and maybe we can get this thing all resolved in 2023. What do you think? I, I know getting to the U S Supreme court is always an uphill battle for certiorari cases. What are you, what do you think the chances are for this one, Doug, if you had a crystal ball? Yeah, if I had a crystal, so put, put, put some of the math out there and I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be a, an expert in the Supreme Court, but it is my understanding you get tens of thousands of cases that appeal to the Supreme Court every year. And the Supreme Court with, I don't know, maybe there's some exceptions to this, but the Supreme Court uh, basically has discretion on anything they take. I don't know of anything that they have to take. So they actually take less than 1% of cases that want to go to them. So then the U.S. Supreme Court, when it, so, so you know it's an uphill battle. So they're looking for cases that are important legally. They're important uh, to the greater good, the public, the economy, whatever you want to call it, uh, and present some un unique legal questions that need to be resolved. And one of the things uh, that they look for is, is there a split? So the reason I think that if, if uh, you throw up all of the cases that are going to get appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court right now, I think the trucking case has a better than average chance. I don't know if that means it's a 10% chance. I, I don't know. But it's better than most that it will get picked. And that's because you have the eastern seaboard that has said this is preempted. And you have the Western seaboard that has said this is not preempted. And you have one of the largest and most important industries to the entire U.S. economy at stake. I don't know if I'd say the whole industry is at stake, but a huge chunk of it is at stake. Uh, and there are so many people that, 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 that are engaged in it. Uh, it is of note that there were... Um, I can't quote the, the exact number, but there were a lot of industry associations that supported this effort. 
And that usually is a good sign for, for cases getting taken. So long-winded way of saying um, better than the average case chance, but everybody needs to recognize it's really hard to get a case to the U.S. Supreme Court. So let me ask you, if a case does get cert granted and we do get a favorable ruling, what does a favorable ruling look like? Are we going to get clarity? Once the dust settles from that ruling, are we going to have clarity? Or are we still going to be operating in this gray, murky area with the IC status? Great question. Uh, the Supreme Court obviously will have the opportunity to provide a lot of clarity. They also, uh, in, in a very frustrating way, uh, can sometimes find very particular procedural grounds to make some decisions that don't really do a lot and just kind of pump this thing down the road. Um, I like to think that in the next two years or so, because uh, I think the timeline is it'll be sometime in, we'll find out in early 22, ha first half of 22, whether or not the case gets taken. My bet is I think it does get taken. I think sometime then in 2023, we get that answer. I think it will be some of uh, some kind of punting it back to the Ninth Circuit, uh, but in a way that gives the industry enough clarity to know that AB5 as it exists today is not okay. So uh, I, 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 Jared, you and I jo joked offline about the classic, it depends answer from a lawyer. Um, I got to give a lot of whole bunch of it depends is in here, but with as much clarity as I can muster, I would say is it won't answer every question. The lawyers will still have business opportunities to, to make money after this, um, <laughs> but there'll be enough clarity to, to, to ease some of the frustration. Here's the big caveat. The, the U.S. Congress, the feds could pass their version of AB5 tomorrow, and who cares what California did? The feds created their own problem. I mean, so we're always at the mercy of the next federal election. Yeah, you mentioned the PRO Act. Doug, tell, tell everybody what that's about and how that might impact independent contractor status if we ever see it go anywhere. So the PRO Act is like the world's worst piece of legislation that's ever been created. Um, to put <laughs> That's it saying a lot. <laughs> Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's not actually the worst. Uh, it's not a good piece of legislation. Uh, it's a it's a smorgasbord of provisions that are fr that are friendly to uh, organized labor. And I I am honestly not all of it is terrible. There, there's some of it that's probably merit has merit and, and wouldn't be bad to, to see passed. Um, Don't walk it back, Doug. Stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of it is very bad, and um, the. The PRO Act, one of the things it does is it takes Californians' version of the ABC test and would make it federal law for purposes of the National Labor Relations Act, which don't think that that's just about unions. That's not just about unions. Uh, that, that's about what's called unfair labor practices uh, and a variety of other things. Uh, it would be a significant uh, blow to the industry. And realistically, I don't see how you would uh, try to, I don't see how a carrier would say, okay, you're an employee for the National Labor Relations Act and you're an independent contractor for everything else. So if the PRO Act passed, I don't think a motor carrier would maintain the traditional independent contractor model as we know it today. It would have to morph quite dramatically. The good news is, uh, knock on wood, uh, I don't see the PRO Act going anywhere, especially without any change to the filibuster rules. And even if the filibuster rule did change, I still think it would be an uphill battle. So independent contractor status in the transportation world is huge, and it's always been huge, um, but it's huge in other industries as well. So a lot of the misclassification litigation we're seeing in the transportation world, but is it the case that it's other um, IC heavy industries that are causing this legislative legislative push. Is that the case? Uh, it's interesting, Brenda. So a little bit of I, I tell a little bit of a side story because it's a great point that this isn't just a transportation industry. One of the most notable independent contractor status cases in the past, call it 30, 40 years, is actually Microsoft, uh, and it has to do with uh, software engineers 
that were changed uh, to were, were transitioned to independent contractors and offered you know two or three times the pay. Uh, but here you can uh, we'll, we'll transition to independent contractors. Well, I believe if if my memory is right, this was back in the late '80s that this happened. So fast forward to the mid '90s, and Microsoft stock is just going nuts. And there were employees, a lot of these software engineers that stayed as employees were getting employee stock options. So they're becoming very, very wealthy. And all the, the software engineers that chose to become independent weren't getting the stock. The, the stock. That's one of the most notable misclassification claims in, like you said, in the past 30, 40 years. So this is not just a trucking uh, case. Um, you, you scared are, me, Doug. You scared me, Doug. I thought you were going to talk about all the exotic dancer independent contractor <laughs> cases that are out there. There are those too. Uh, there, there are plenty of those. Uh, but uh, let, let me answer your question. Yes, construction is is always notable and and, and a reason for this push. Uh, technology is a push. The gig economy is a big reason for this push. Um, the politicians that I've talked to uh, over the years have have quietly said. The traditional over-the-road trucking is not the target, but we're in, but we're caught in the crossfire. The target is is more of the gig economy and, and what happens in construction and so on. Um, I think in California, a big issue is the environment, uh, and it has to do back the 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 AB five battle in California dates back to the to the American Trucking Association fighting the city of Los Angeles, the ports of Los Angeles, and all that stuff over the CARB rules. Because uh, you remember, CARB tried to ban owner operators, and ATA, uh, thankfully, uh, great work by that team, beat them. Doug, I know there's a lot of uncertainty, especially on the coast right now. What's your advice for? carriers who are located in problematic states like California who have owner operator fleets? Specific to California, I'm in wait and see mode because AB5 is not technically in effect. It, it is, um, the, the injunction remains in effect as we wait to see what happens with, uh, with the AB5 litigation. So I am in wait and see mode, but I am, I am engaging some professional help on what if, uh, because it's not like the court's going to make up their mind and you're going to have two more years to do something. Whatever happens in the court, whenever that is decided, you're not going to have a lot of time. And the state of California is going to be chomping at the bit to enforce this. Uh, and they're going to say, hey, you've had three, four, five years to get ready. So you should be engaging with professional advisors on what does your business model look like if this, what does it look like if that? Um, and we probably don't have enough time to start getting down the path of what those things are. Some variations of brokerage or freight forwarder models, if AB5 does go into effect. And some are transferring over to W2 models, right? Yep. That's which California is not an easy state to employ people in either, but yes, that is the other option. I was going to ask you real quick. I mean, I've worked with a couple of large independent contractor fleets on safety related issues. And so on the one hand, one extreme, you have an independent contractor fleet that really just doesn't want to impose, you know, safety standards and training requirements and, you know, policies and procedures surrounding safety uh, that, that, that are directly impacted by the FMCSRs. And then on the other hand, you have carriers that say, well, it's more important for me to make these ICs safe, make them comply with the regulations and avoid nuclear verdicts because of these highway accidents. I mean, is the formula somewhere in the middle ideal for you or on one extreme? It is definitely somewhere in the middle. And I would say this, um, you don't win or lose independent contractor status on one factor with one exception. If if the guy, if the contractor guy or gal cannot turn down freight, you're gonna lose and you're gonna lose on that factor. So let's set that obvious example aside. You don't win or lose independent contractor status on one factor. It's always a balancing test. So I am gonna tell you, hey, motor vehicle accident risk is a huge risk in your business, just like misclassification risk is. Um, so you cannot ignore one in favor of the other. Uh, if you are gonna tow the line, tow it in safety. 
Uh, there, there are even some states that have exceptions when it comes to control for safety related things. Uh, so, so you, you, you've got that to, to fall back on, but, but no, you should still have stringent safety standards. Wendy hit on some good ways to, to thread the needle and there are some other ways too, but, but there are ways to thread that needle between, I am still going to have high safety standards. I am still going to make sure that whether they're contractors or drivers, that they meet my standards, but they're and still couch it in ways that you protect the independent contractor status. Do not, I do would not ever advise a trucking company just say, well, they're independent contractors, so I'm not responsible or or they're responsible for safety. That's that's not an okay answer. You're you're gonna lose. Because Dad, can, can we hire you as a as a spokesman for us? <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. <laughs> because I, I was going to say, generally speaking, I mean, if you're um, forcing your ICs or you're requiring your ICs to comply with a regulation, a safety regulation, I mean, that's control that you can kind of exert, correct? Yes. There, there are a variety of, there are, there are literally like a hundred plus tests for what it means to be an independent contractor out there. It, most of them uh, the case law, the statutory language will allow you to enforce say, uh, government requirements or to enforce shipper requirements. And the third thing I would do would be minor administrative requirements like, hey, to get paid, you have to turn in your paperwork by Tuesday. Like that's a, usually not going to get too much trouble for something like that. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Doug, we're running out of time here for the show, so I'm going to bring Wendy back up um, and we will work on signing things off here. I just want to turn it over to both of you, see if you have any uh, final closing thoughts here. Wendy, anything else? <laughs> well, so Doug is extremely knowledgeable on the subject. We've talked many, many times, and and I, I just think what he has to say is, is tremendous. I did not know that he's published. And so I was looking up this article, Doug, you don't sing your praises as often <laughs> as loudly as you should. So I'll be reading that later today. I can guarantee you that. Um, I, I think for us, what, in watching all of this legislation and, and seeing what's going on nationally, if it, and I told one of our legislators here in the state of Arizona um, a couple of weeks ago, give us a path forward and we will provide tools and resources and technology to support it. Um, a good example of that is Prop 22 in California. The voters spoke. They said, hey, this is this is something we think is important. Prop 22 matters and it makes sense. And then immediately a judge turned around and said it's unconstitutional. So we started, we're a solutions company, right? We're, we're going to create technology that supports a Prop 22 model. We started moving down that road and then now it's unconstitutional. It's if, if they could give us a path forward, which is what I'm hoping that we'll get here in the next year or so, then we can create a path for independent contractors because they want to do this. They want to be flexible. They want to be their own business owner. And, and so they just, they just want to know how to do it successfully. We can help them with that, but we can't seem to get a straight answer from any state or federal agency at this point. Doug, any last points? Uh, I would say three briefly. Uh, first is uh, don't half-ass your independent contractor program. It's got to be, you got to respect the independence from beginning to end. It starts with your advertising all the way through the end of your relationship. Everything's got to support independence. Uh, number two, your lease purchase program is probably where you're going to make the most mistakes. Uh, I'm not saying you can't have lease purchase programs. There are a lot of great lease purchase programs out there, but that's the place to look out for issues uh, and, and to be the most careful. Uh, and third, especially, engage on the issue. I was just going to say, Doug, especially what I've seen with the lease back programs. Yes. Yes. So. And there are some some very specific state regulations on those things. And we don't, we don't have the time here, but but there's a, there's a growing piece of, of cases going on out there, a new theory, which is if you are offering a lease purchase program, you are offering something akin to a franchise. So you are seeing carriers be sued under franchise consumer protection type of law uh, laws. Um, so far, knock on wood, trucking companies are winning those cases, uh, but it's always noteworthy when you see a new theory come out. Uh, and, uh, and the last thing is engage. 
educate. I, like I said at the beginning, my biggest frustration is if you don't believe in independent contractors, um, I, I can respect your opinion as long as you're doing it uh, on the truth, not on myths. So it's on us as the industry to make sure we're educating policymakers on what independent contractor programs are really about. Awesome. Well, thanks to you both so much for, for being on with us. We really appreciate your insight. Um, and, and we look to, to hear from you, um, in all your other endeavors and everybody will go out and read Doug's paper now. So <laughs> university of Denver doesn't even know what to hit them. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to get flooded. All right. Thanks both to you both. Thanks. All thanks. right. Such great show. Uh, a lot of good tips from, from Wendy and Doug. Um, just so excited to, to have them on and talk about this important topic. So, um, you know, I think from my perspective, uh, I think the, the advice a lot of times is just going to be to, to take a hard look at your program that you now, it, that you have now, if you have an owner operator fleet, spend some time looking at it. The last thing you want to do is end up in a, in a battle without, um, knowing where things stand. So, so take a close look at it, see if you can implement any, any changes to, uh, to, to help bolster the status of your owner operators. Anything to wrap up yeah. here, Jared? Yeah, absolutely. I, I echo what you just said, and I don't want to beat the dead horse here, but if you don't have an experienced IC attorney looking at your practices, I mean, you should probably consider uh, working with an attorney to have a review done, uh, kind of a risk assessment of your program. Certainly will help you there. Um, if you have uh, show ideas or guest ideas, please shoot those over to us. Uh, don't be bashful on that front. I couldn't post the link to the article in the comments. So what we're going to do is put that in the show notes. So look for that. Uh, thank you to our guests and thank you to all of you for listening. I'll turn it back over to Brandon. Yeah. And just lastly, um, the thing we want to do at, at the end of all of our shows is just let you know some of the things we've got going on at TruckSafe. Um, obviously, we do this show monthly, but we also have a ton of other free content that we're constantly pushing out there on our social media channels. So make sure you follow us on YouTube and, and LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and all of them. Uh, we're constantly sending out free content, uh, mostly on safety regulations to motor carriers. So if you have an interest in that, take a look there, follow us. Um, and also, we also have a uh, a library of comprehensive regulatory courses for safety managers and drivers that we have available over at trucksafeacademy.com. So be sure you take a look there. Um, if, if nothing else, Jared, I think we wrap it up here. So thanks everybody for watching. Uh, tune in next, uh, next month. We're not quite sure what the show is going to be yet. It's probably going to be, um, on, on safety related issues. We've got some ideas and, and we think we'll have a great show. We just haven't nailed it down quite yet. So tune in next month. We'll, we'll put some information about it here shortly. We'll get there. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. See ya.